mysterious symbols, timelines revealed in dreams, messages of doom? The books of Daniel and Revelation can seem like the most daunting parts of the Bible. You might think, maybe I'll read that later. These books may be complicated at first glance, but they embody the beautiful unveiling of Jesus' rescue plan for our world, a plan which is unfolding right now. That's why we've created a unique space at godled.org where you can study these important books of prophecy for yourself, one interactive lesson at a time. Starting today, learn how the Bible unlocks itself. Go at your own pace and get real feedback from the God-led community as you study through our easy to navigate course. Don't wait any longer to understand God's plan for you as revealed in these important prophecies. Start unraveling the biblical books of Daniel and Revelation at godled.org. Welcome back to the 2021 Kentucky Tennessee Conference Virtual Camp Meeting. It is an honor to introduce our speaker again, Dr. Leslie Pollard. He began his presidency of Oakwood University in 2011. His tenure is notable for the launch of Oakwood Online University. More than $30 million of on-campus construction and improvements have been made during his tenure, which includes the creation of Oakwood Organic Farms, the largest urban farm in Northern Alabama. His leadership has helped to guide the university in its transition from an institution of the General Conference to one that serves within the North American Division. Among many gifts and talents, Dr. Pollard has served the church as a pastor, educator, and administrator. He is widely viewed as the church's foremost expert in the important area of cultural diversity. His message this evening is Mind Your Head. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for the opportunity to meet together, even in such settings as we are having to deal with. We give you honor and glory, Lord, that you have enabled your servant to rightly divide the Word of God. And we pray right now that his message tonight will enable, enable each one of us to know your will for our lives more completely. Now, please send your spirit, Lord, upon Dr. Pollard and upon us too, and we pray it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Friends, my name is Marshall McKenzie, and I'm the Church Growth Director of the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. Last year, I spoke to you about renew. Those five letters, 
that represent reflection, empowerment, nurture, evangelize, and witness. We've been building those sites, and I'm excited to tell you they continue to develop so that we can have resources for the local churches, so that they can be revitalized, so that we can get back to God's model of church growth and church planting. You know, I'm excited that as we've developed those websites, we've also developed new tools that we're adding to those. One of those is the Bible Optics Newsletter. You know, when COVID hit, a lot of churches closed down because of COVID. And so we weren't able to connect as often as we would have liked to. So we developed the Bible Optics Newsletter. The purpose of that newsletter was to help you to connect electronically, even if we couldn't connect personally in our local churches. Our communities need to know that we're there. Whether COVID or not, we're there. We're there to serve and we're there to be a blessing. The Bible Optics newsletter we made personally for the pastors so that they could put their face and, and their name on the Bible Optics newsletter so that the truths that were being sent out in a professional manner to the communities could truly track the communities back to the local church. Everything is about the local church that we're doing in the church growth department. We believe in the, the purpose of the local church and that God in the last days is gonna use the local church in special ways to reach their community with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so these tools are vital. One of the other tools we've kind of developed outside with the COVID thing is our online Bible school. You know, it's important to have personal Bible studies, but with so many people online and so many people using technology, the Kentucky Tennessee Conference felt the need to have our own online Bible school that could be an enhancement to what our Bible workers are doing, that it can be an enhancement to what our churches are doing, that it can enhance the lay member and, and their desire to witness and to reach out and to study the Bible with others. What I'm so excited about with our online Bible school is that in whatever program you do, or whatever meeting, Zoom meeting you're having, you can always tell people about the online Bible school. And when they sign up to take the class, they put their zip code in there with their email and their name. And with that zip code, we can actually send that interest right back to you, but electronically. So you can actually form a group online through the forum. So as this group is studying the Bible in your area electronically, you can be interacting with them in the same way so that eventually one day you will meet up in person. So I'm excited about the online Bible school. You know, I'm excited with how God is blessing in so many ways as we take the tools that we have, our online website and the resources we're building with Renew, our Bible Optics newsletter, which we're trying to provide professional content to the pastors, to the communities, and now with our online Bible school, I believe God has something very special in store for the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. And I wanna tell you something, your churches are vital, they do matter, and God does want them to grow. There is no doubt in my mind. And so God has a very special plan. I believe he's preparing his churches for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As we take these tools to reach people, and we start utilizing technology in ways that God would have us to use technology, I believe that we're just breaking the surface in terms of what we can accomplish together for the glory of God. You know, Jesus is coming soon, and we wanna do everything we can to revitalize our churches and to plant new churches. You know, Ellen White said there should be a church in every city, town, and village. And by the grace of God, may that be our goal moving forward to have a church in every city, town, and village. And with the tools that we're developing at the conference level, we wanna be able to support you in accomplishing that goal. Friends, I wanna thank you so much for your prayers. And I continue to covet your prayers as we move forward together into the future, expecting Jesus to return very soon. May God bless you, and may God truly grow your church and help your church to be all that he desires it to be. Our scripture reading this evening 
is Philippians 2, 1 through 5. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having one in the same love, being one in the Spirit and one of the mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. The things that I love and hold dear to my heart are just borrowed. They're not mine at all. Jesus only let me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Just remember I'm human and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Nothing good have I done to deserve God's own son. I'm not worthy of the scars in his hands. Yet he chose the road to Calvary to die in my stead. Why he loved me, I can't understand. Just remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show Just remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Roll back the curtain of me. Just remember, I'm human, and humans forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. So remind me, remind me.
My name is Leslie Pollard, and I'm president of Oakwood University. I'm so glad today to have this moment just to share the Word of God with you. And our text today comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And I'll only select one portion of that passage. It says, set your mind on things above. The title of my sermon today is Mind Your Head. Prior to the COVID pandemic, 60 Oakwood University faculty participated in a donor-funded cruise dedicated to biblical foundations. On that cruise, we would learn how to incorporate Bible perspectives into every every subject taught in our university. After we uh, took an excursion from the cruise, we were returning to the ship. And as I was coming back up the galley entrance, I saw something that I had never noticed because it was behind me as I was exiting. There was a sign there that said, mind your head. Mind your head meant make sure that you don't bump your head on a dangerously low galley. It meant that mind was an old way of saying, be careful, be cautious, be alert, pay attention. Mind your head meant don't do anything that will hurt your head. Take care not to hit your head. Don't bump your head. Don't knock your head against the metal gateway. Mind your head. Today, that's what our message is. That's my message to you today. You've got to mind your head. I want to urge you who are listening to mind your head because the mind is gifted territory. It's precious territory. It is contested territory. Did you know that your mind is a major battlefield? It is. It's as much a battlefield as was Gettysburg. It's as much a battlefield as was Okinawa. It's as much a battlefield as was Iwo Jima. It's a battlefield, and it's really a very small battlefield, about six and a half inches long, three and a half inches high. There is a tiny battlefield between your ears, but between your ears is a violent battle raging all around you. It's a battle for your mind. 60 minutes of every hour, 24 hours of every day, seven days of every week. Scholar Donald Gray Barnhouse wrote a book about it. He called it The Invisible War. And in it, he argues, if ever there was a time for us to mind our heads, that time is now because our minds are under assault. They are. Advertisers are battling for our minds. With only 6% of the world's population, America receives 57% of the world's advertising. The United States is by far the largest advertising market in the world. In 2016, more than $190 billion were spent in advertising in the United States. That's more than double the amount spent advertising in China, which is the second largest market in the world. Advertisers are battling for our minds, and they're battling through the pursuit of fantasy. Advertisers say to you, buy this and you will be whole. They say, own that and you will be happy. Live here and you will be honored, praised, liked, loved. Commercial messages program us to believe that we can have it all. Every single day, our minds are coming under assault. Look at how advertisers battle for our minds. Have you ever checked out one of the shopping networks, it doesn't matter which one, they all have a common characteristic. This product will set you apart. It will distinguish you. It will compliment you. It will make you look slimmer, taller, more beautiful, more attractive. You get more interest, you get more attention. Advertisers are battling for our minds. Politicians are battling for our minds. Whether it's a government shutdown, Uh, whether it's a conversation about border walls, uh, whether it's uh, alleged Russian collusion in American election, um, immigration issues at the border, um, all of these things, there is a battle for our minds. In 2013, CNN reports that 850,000 federal employees were furloughed per day by agencies that uh, that were considered by the U.S. Congress to be vital. Did you know that every day politicians, uh, every year, U.S. Congress passes maybe 500 different laws, but then the regulatory agencies 
affiliated with government, sometimes promulgate 10,000 new rules and regulations in the same amount of time. Politicians are battling for our minds. Our minds are under assault. Politicians say, vote right, vote left. Whatever it is, our minds are under assault. Social media is battling for our minds. Think about it. Caustic assaults in social media that demean and denigrate people, like a sporting event. Right now, psychologists are talking about a new phenomenon. They call it digital addiction. Think about it. Think about how many people cannot separate themselves from their devices. Social media is battling for our minds. And digital addiction is driven by the need to be affirmed, to be connected, to be uh, applauded, to be celebrated. Because social media, according to one commentator, social media puts a microphone in every hand. And yet, a former Facebook executive issued a warning about social media. It was interesting. After he had left, after he had left Facebook as one of its founders, Kamath Palahaptia, now a venture capitalist and a co-owner of Golden State Warriors, said something very interesting on December 11, 2017. He was speaking to the Stanford business students, and he explained how Facebook corrodes social discourse. It creates what he called, quote, a fake, brittle popularity, a short-term dopamine-driven feedback loop that destroys how society works. And this is his quote. He said, we curate our lives around this perceived sense of perfection because we get rewarded in the short term with signals, hearts, likes, thumbs up. And we conflate that, listen to him now, listen, we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. And instead, what it really is, is a fake, brittle popularity that leaves you more vacant than even before. And the clincher in his speech to those Stanford business students was this. He said, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. So mind your head, because if it's not advertising, if it's not politics, if it's not social media, then guess what else assaults our minds? It is the cares of this life in Mark chapter 4, verse 19. The worries of this age, Mark chapter 13, verse 22. The cares of this life battle for our mind. For many, making it from one day to the next is a psychological burden. It's a battle for the mind. A person is unemployed, and then the mind comes under assault. Our peace is under assault. Our outlook is under assault. Our joy is under assault. Satan assaults our minds. He worries us about our finances, our marital stresses. Oh, and did I mention the mental health challenges associated with the pandemic? Bereavement, isolation, loss of income, and fear are triggering mental health conditions or exacerbating existing ones. Many people may be facing increased levels of alcohol and drug use because of the pandemic. Insomnia is up. Anxiety is up. The cares of this life that lead to the lonely belief that nobody cares, that God has abandoned us, that nobody can help. Satan battles for our mind, but guess what? The good news is that Christ is battling for our minds as well because Christ knows that the mind is the center of our conscious being. The mind is the seat of reason, feeling, will, perception, and judgment. And if Satan can bind the mind, now you're looking at me like I'm making this up, but if Satan can bind our minds through deception, delusion, and possession, then he knows he can control the whole person. When I turn to the Bible, I see what Satan's mind-binding power can do. Guess what? Did you ever notice and when Satan was in control of a human being in the Gospels, we notice that his mind bind does certain things. First of all, it can rob you of your self-control. Matthew chapter 9, verse 33. After the demon was cast out, then the man would try to speak. Here's another thing that it can do, his mind bind can do. It can actually make you into a spiritualistic medium 
Notice how many times in the Bible, Mark chapter 1, verse 23, when a person would try to speak, and then the demons would speak, and the demons would say, we know who you are. You are Jesus of Nazareth. Notice now, the human wanted to speak, but then the demon spoke. Here's another thing that his mind buying can do. It can help you demonstrate supernatural strength and not in a good way. Mark chapter 5, verses 4 through 5. The man was restrained with shackles and chains, but he broke them, and no one had the strength to subdue it. And last but not least, in Mark chapter 9, verse 22, guess what? Satan's mind-binding assault upon your mind can actually drive you to suicidal tendencies. Mark chapter 9, verse 22 it records the story of the man who casts himself into the fire and into the water. You remember the poor man came to Jesus and said, please help me. He casts himself in the fire and in the water, and, and he's trying to destroy himself. Let me tell you, everybody, that's Satan's goal. I hope you're listening to me. Nothing less than the total binding of the mind. And that's why in Matthew's gospel, in Mark, Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, Satan is called a strong man. That's what it says. He's called a strong man. Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. The strong man can bind the mind. But here is the good news of the gospel. And it's so exciting. The good news of the gospel. While Satan is a strong man, God sent a stronger man. Matthew chapter 12. Jesus said, he said, no man can enter into the strong man's house except he first bind the strong man. And that's what Jesus did. 2,000 years ago, he came down to earth as heaven's stronger man, and he grabbed the strong man, and he bound him up, and then he set the captives free. And what did he do? After he set them free, he implanted in them a new mind. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, we have the mind of Christ, God's great gift to believers. Yes, it's justification. We talk about cancel culture today. Well, guess what? Here is some good news. Jesus cancels out the old debt. Yes, he does. He cancels Satan's claims that this person is mine because I have bound their mind. And he justifies us, and he begins now to sanctify us. He erases the record. He cancels the old debt. He covers your tattered life and my tattered life, and he grants us a new credit account because our credit score was somewhere between zero and minus a thousand. And yet, he justifies, he sanctifies, and he sets up an account, and he says, now you can make charges in my name. He restores, he inoculates, and he plants in us a new mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Do not be conformed to this age, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I just want to say something because I know you're listening. Now, we've often applied this passage to externals. Dress, makeup, fashion, haircuts. But the world is more than the way we present ourselves. When Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this age, he's talking about the thinking patterns of this age. And what is the greatest thinking pattern of this age, everyone? You know what it is? Philosophers call it the sovereign self. The belief that self, is the ultimate and final frame of reference for decision-making. The sovereign self sets the standard for law. It sets the standard for morality. It sets the standard for right and wrong. You want an example of the sovereign self? You've heard it a hundred times, but it comes out of a philosophical doctrine. It says, after all, whatever people do in the privacy of their own homes, that's their right because they are consenting adults, the sovereign self. The world is a system of thinking. It's the way the world thinks about the word of God. The world represents anything in this world that is dedicated to rebellion against God. This world means, this world concept means that all the rebellion we see, and don't we see a lot of it, we take it for granted. We're almost inoculated to it because it comes at us with, in, in such rapidity and with such overwhelming force. It's like a wave washing over us all the time. 
But think about how much of the rebellion against God you get to see in films and in music and in art and in philosophy and academia and science. The world. That's what Paul is talking about. Do not let the world. Um, I was watching a movie one time uh, called Transformers. And uh, these little boys didn't know it, but they had stepped, for those of you who've seen it, they had stepped into what was called an alien contamination zone. Um, I love the Transformers series because I really think this is a way that the sci-fi devotees were actually reaching for. They couldn't get it, but they were reaching for the great controversy. You know, you think about it. Megatron, the evil enemy. Transformers are declared to be illegal on Earth. And then they send others to the Earth. Um, and they, they are evil Transformers. They're called Decepticons. I love that term. They're called Decepticons. Uh, uh, the main Transformer is called Optimus Prime. And, 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 and they keep reaching. They keep reaching for the, the great controversy. But but they can't get there. And, and they are Autobots, you know. And the Autobots are saying to, uh, that, 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 that we want these evil Decepticons and others to leave planet Earth alone. And Castro allows them to look. Uh, you, you'll get a chance to read at it. You know, it's narrated by Anthony Hopkins. And these evil beings keep arriving. And, and then these four little boys stumble into an alien contamination zone. And, and, but there's one Transformer called Canopy whose job it is to protect the kids. Long ago, in a world created by God, a cosmic interloper fell to planet Earth, and guess what? He was nothing other than an evil transformer in the garden. He began as an angel, but he almost transformed himself into a Decepticon, the serpent at the tree. And in the last day, Scripture is quick to mention that there will be mind-binding demons who are transformers. They look like one thing, but they are actually something else. When you get an opportunity, read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. These mind-binding demons. Well, I'll just read. Doesn't the Bible say, marvel not that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. An angel of light. He looks like a friend, but he's a Decepticon. The Bible is full of Decepticons. Delilah was a Decepticon. Saul was a Decepticon. Judas was a Decepticon. That girlfriend who says she loves you but has no interest in the things of God, she's a Decepticon. That young man who says that he wants to build his life with you only if he doesn't have to worry about church and God and Jesus, he's a Decepticon. Decepticons. Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Satan is a transformer, but the good news is that God is a transformer. Philippians chapter 2 says that he began as a baby. Let this mind be in you, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He came down to planet Earth, and when he came down, he began his life and through a metamorphosis, planted in the womb of a virgin girl, growing up as a little boy in Nazareth, becoming a carpenter, and then launching out into his messianic ministry at the Jordan River. When John, when he steps up to be baptized in John chapter 1, John says, he hears a voice that says, this is my beloved son. Listen to what he has to say to you. Our minds need renewal, everybody. They need them every day. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, for the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but they are mighty to God through the tearing down of strongholds. Now, there's a lot that we could say about strongholds, but let me just tell you, a stronghold is a foundation that has no basis in leading you and in teaching you the Word of God and in strengthening your life. So now, as we think about what we are going to do, as I wrap up, I just want you to know that every single day, when you think about your mind, just remember that your mind is under assault and that worry can be a stronghold. Just know that you can have distrust as a stronghold, skepticism as a stronghold. Helpless negativity can be a stronghold. All of these are strongholds in the mind. 
seeking the other approval of people can be a stronghold that Satan sets up in your mind. But the good news is anything that Satan has set up, God is able and willing to overthrow. So how do you overthrow strongholds in the mind? How do you do it? First, okay, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Set your mind on things above and not on things below. Set your mind. Set your mind. You've got to make a choice. Set your mind. The same way you set a thermostat. The same way you set your navigation coordinates on your GPS. Set your mind on things above, and God will bless you. Here's the second way that you can overthrow these strongholds and that you can mind your head. Stop believing everything that people say and think. Now, it's called critical thinking. It's thinking about the way we think. And remember now, Mrs. Ellen White said, teach the youth to be thinkers and not reflectors of other people's thoughts. Stop believing everything that you hear. Just because it is uttered on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or Newsmax doesn't make it true. Think for yourselves. Ask God to lead you into spirit-guided thinking because what God wants for the youth, he also wants for you and me, that we would not be reflectors of other people's thoughts, but thinkers for ourselves. Stop believing everything that other people think. Here's something else you need to do, though. Stop believing everything that you think. Because the Bible says, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the human heart is deceitful and desperately wicked because the devil is a liar. We cannot often trust our own thinking. We have to take, take our thinking back to the word of God. That's what God wants us to do. These strongholds will be overthrown when we put our trust in the word of God. Racism is a stronghold in some people's minds. White supremacy is a stronghold in some people's minds. Black supremacy is a stronghold in many people's minds. But that's okay. We serve a God who can surgically overthrow strongholds. You remember the story of Peter? Peter had a stronghold of racial supremacy in Acts chapter 10 that required a vision from God to accept the Gentiles. And look at how God worked with Peter. Now, understand me, understand me. Now, this is the same Peter who on the day of Pentecost preached the gospel, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and now thousands of people were baptized in Acts chapter 2. But in Acts chapter 10, he's still dealing with his own racial prejudice. But here's the good news in the story. God doesn't give up on us. God is not a practitioner of cancel culture. He gives us a chance over and over and over again because he has us on a journey. And look at what finally happens to Peter. The light goes off in his head and he says, of a truth I know, Acts chapter 10, that God is no respecter of persons. So set your mind on things above, not on things below. Set your mind. Advertisers are trying to set your mind. Set your mind. Social media is trying to set your mind. Set your mind. Politicians are trying to set your mind. Set your mind the way you set your mobile device. Set your mind the way you set a table. Set your mind. Set your mind on positivity, and God will take you to positive places. Set your mind on positivity, and you will attract positive people. Set your mind on positivity, and you will develop, and you will communicate a positive perspective. Set your mind. Mind your head. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I'm a big NBA fan, even while it was being played in the bubble. Let, let me just say to you, um, there are lots of players who start a game, but you know what matters most? Who can finish the game? Thank God that this text in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says that Jesus is a finisher. Jesus didn't fret over what people may have said or thought. He didn't, he didn't spend his time talking about insignificant ideas. So if people talk 
Let them talk. Consider it a symbol of your significance. But what we love about Jesus is that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is a finisher. And when you trust him, he will set your mind. So let me share with you what he did. He beat Satan as a baby, not a maybe. Though unspeakably wise, he was wisely speechless. Like finding breaches on Normandy's beaches, the racist biological seed came to rescue Earth's title deed, hungry souls to feed, prisoners to be freed, because God decreed that the woman's seed would come and bleed and meet our deepest need. He came to bleed, we got freed, and he met our psychological need. Father for the orphan, hiding place for the homeless, anchor for the abuse, storm the gates of hell with a rebel yell. It is finished, the devil is diminished. Turned in my SAG card, got tired of being an actor or an actress, I needed rest, so Jesus became my sleep number mattress. His presence is a present that he offers to every peasant. Jesus, if you need health, he's a wonder drug. Jesus is a bottle of gold, takes just one drop to cure a sin-sick soul. Sustainer, creator, heaven's dominator, man's elevator, Satan's activator. Nobody greater, praise him now, not later. So a reaper. God's promise keeper, destroyed the grim reaper, mopped him up like a carpet sweeper, not in part, but the whole. You can feel him in your soul. So let's praise him in Espanol. Poderoso, adoramos a Dios. Jesus es merio de Dios. Love him more. From your core, wake up. He's the winner for every sinner. Jehovah Jireh, like Pentecost, handing out fire. He wants to take you higher. He is the source and sustainer of all things. He is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. Wise men came from the East because the baby wasn't a baby, he was a beast. They came not by Facebook, but for a face-to-face -face look. Weakness, no meekness. Powerful meekness with power in his hand. No weapon formed against him will ever stand because he's the man and in him we stand. His talk meets his walk and his walk matches his talk. He took the cross, a death which was a shame to mention, through his death became a new invention. He alone saves his own. What he started, he finished, so he's undiminished. No need for Snapchat because he's all that. He puts his mind in you because he finds in you. He unwinds in you a name that overcomes shame. Like when you first got hit and you wanted to quit, he said, stay in the game. Let my mind be in you and the rest will not be mystery. It will be history, his story, your story, for his glory, amen. Mind your head. Thank you for joining us for our second night of We Would See Jesus, our 2021 Kentucky Tennessee Conference's online camp meeting. Tomorrow evening, we begin a series with James Widegardner from Keene, Texas, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pastor Gardner is a pastor and a lawyer and has also worked with Adventist Health. During his messages this week, he will be introducing us to five biblical characters who followed God by faith and willed to see Jesus. We start tomorrow evening with Moses' request to show me your glory. I know you won't want to miss it. Join us back here at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And friends, I encourage you, bring a friend. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the start of our camp meeting. This weekend has been truly a major blessing and an encouragement. And yet, we've been challenged by the messages that we've heard. Lord, this is just the beginning, and I pray that your spirit will guide and direct us as we continue through our camp meeting time together. May the messages that we're about to receive and continue to receive truly, truly inspire us to be your servants in these last days of Earth's history because all of us desire to see you. We truly would see Jesus. May you guide and direct us this evening. May we get a good night's rest. And Lord, guide us again back to this time together with you tomorrow evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mysterious symbols, timelines revealed in dreams, messages of doom, 
The books of Daniel and Revelation can seem like the most daunting parts of the Bible. You might think, maybe I'll read that later. These books may be complicated at first glance, but they embody the beautiful unveiling of Jesus' rescue plan for our world, a plan which is unfolding right now. That's why we've created a unique space at godled.org where you can study these important books of prophecy for yourself, one interactive lesson at a time. Starting today, learn how the Bible unlocks itself. Go at your own pace and get real feedback from the God-led community as you study through our easy-to-navigate course. Don't wait any longer to understand God's plan for you as revealed in these important prophecies. Start unraveling the biblical books of Daniel and Revelation at godled.org.